Hello everyone and welcome to this video on MS-DOS. In this video, we will be covering what the landscape was like before MS-DOS, how MS-DOS changed personal computing, and how it still affects us today. Before we hop right into the video, make sure to subscribe to the channel since it helps out a lot. Before MS-DOS became a staple of the computing world, personal computers were far from standardized. In the late 70s and early 1980s, it was a wild west of competing hardware and software platforms. Companies like Apple, Commodore, and Tandy all had their own systems, and none of them played very nicely with each other. The Apple II, for example, was a huge success in schools and homes thanks to its relatively friendly basic interpreter and accessible hardware, but it ran a proprietary operating system that didn't talk to anything else. Meanwhile, the Commodore 64, one of the best-selling personal computers of all time, was beloved for its graphics and sound, especially in gaming, but it was largely soiled in terms of software compatibility. Programs written for a Commodore would not run on an Apple or Tandy machine. Each brand was essentially its own island. This created major headaches for users and developers alike. If you bought a program, it had to be made for your specific computer, not just your operating system, but your exact hardware. There was no universal file format, no shared architecture, and, and certainly no plug-and-play standard. Even something as basic as storage varied widely. Some used cassette tapes, others used floppies, some people used them all together. There was just no agreement on file systems either. Most of these early machines also booted straight into a command line environment or a basic prompt. You weren't greeted with a desktop or GUI. You were expected to type in commands or even write your own code just to get things done. This was very common in the age. It was very powerful in the hands of the right user, but definitely not beginner friendly. There was also no dominant player in the software market, which meant development was fragmented. If you were a programmer, you had to choose which system support. Importing software across platforms was often time consuming and rarely profitable. In short, the personal computer world before MS-DOS was fragmented, inconsistent, and anything but user friendly. MS-DOS didn't fix everything overnight, but it introduced a layer of standardization that helped unify the market. It wasn't flashy, in fact it was just a command line, but it was stable, predictable, and quickly became the backbone of the IBM PC ecosystem. When MS-DOS arrived on the scene in 1981, it didn't just give the IBM PC an operating system, it quietly reshaped the entire direction of personal computing. At first glance, MS-DOS might have not looked like anything special. It was a simple, text-based operating system with limited features, and it didn't have the flair of Apple's graphical interface or the multimedia powers of the Commodore computers. But it had one thing those systems didn't, backing from IBM. IBM was already a giant in the business world, known for making expensive, enterprise-grade machines. When it decided to enter the personal computer market, it wanted to move fast. Instead of designing everything in-house, IBM took a very open approach. It sourced components from third parties and licensed software externally. For the operating system, IBM turned to a relatively small company at the time called Microsoft. Microsoft, in turn, licensed and rebranded an existing OS called 86DOS, or QDOS, which stood for Quick and Dirty Operating System, from the Seattle Computer Products. It became PC-DOS when sold through IBM, but MS-DOS when Microsoft sold it to others. This is where the shift began. IBM's influence got MS-DOS into the hands of businesses and institutions. But Microsoft's licensing model, which allowed them to sell MS-DOS to other hardware manufacturers, is what truly changed the game. As IBM-compatible clones flooded the market, all of them needed an OS, and MS-DOS became the de facto standard. Suddenly, software developers only had the right for one system, the IBM PC running MS-DOS. That kind of standardization hadn't existed before, and it created a very good feedback loop. More MS-DOS computers meant more software was written for MS-DOS, which meant more people wanted MS-DOS machines. This was where other companies started to fall behind. Commodore, for instance, had sold tens of millions of units of the Commodore 64, 
but they didn't start to embrace the IBM compatible model until their later years. Their later systems like the Amiga were tactically impressive, but they were completely different platforms. As developers shifted focus to MS-DOS, the software libraries for non-DOS systems began to shrink. Commodore eventually collapsed in the 1990s. Apple, on the other hand, tried to go its own way. The Macintosh, released in 1984, was a bold leap into graphical interfaces and user-friendly design. But Apple kept its ecosystem very closed off, tightly controlling the hardware and software, and priced its machines far above what most consumers could even afford. While this worked for some very niche markets like design and education, it couldn't compete with the flood of cheaper MS-DOS based clones that filled the shelves of every electronics store. By the late 1980s, MS-DOS had become the backbone of the personal computing world. It was everywhere, in homes, offices, government buildings, schools, businesses trusted it, developers supported it. Even as graphical environments like Windows began to emerge, they still ran on top of MS-DOS using it to handle low-level system functions. For years, Windows wasn't a replacement for DOS, it was actually an extension of it. The rise of MS-DOS also marked a turning point in how people thought about computers. Before, you bought a computer for the brand, a Commodore, an Apple, a Tandy. After MS-DOS, you bought a PC and expected it to run DOS-compatible software. The operating system became more important than the manufacturer. That shift gave Microsoft a kind of platform that would define the next several decades of computing. MS-DOS wasn't flashy, it wasn't super user-friendly in the way modern systems are, but it was reliable, flexible, and most importantly, it was everywhere. It created common ground for developers, users, and manufacturers. It helped take personal computing out of the niche hobbyist space and into the mainstream. And it paved the way for Microsoft to eventually dominate the desktop market with Windows. MS-DOS didn't change how we use computers, it changed who used them. It brought order to chaos, it gave the software a standard home, and helped turn the personal computer into an everyday tool rather than a cheap specialty device. The companies that failed to adapt, like Commodore, just simply couldn't keep up. By the mid-1990s, personal computers were everywhere, and MS-DOS had served its purpose as the industry standard, but it was also starting to show its age. Running a modern PC off a command line interface wasn't going to cut it anymore. Users wanted something more visual, more intuitive, more easier to use. And Microsoft knew this. In 1995, they released what would become the most iconic operating system of all time, Windows 95. Windows 95 wasn't just a new version of Windows, it was a complete overall of how people interacted with their computers. For the first time, Windows seemed to be fully integrated with MS-DOS instead of just sitting on top of it. However, Windows 95 did still rely on MS-DOS for some features. The true separation came out with Windows NT. Booting into DOS and then first launching into Windows was gone. Now, Windows was the main event. The interface was a major leap forward. It introduced features that we take for granted today, like the start menu, the taskbar, desktop icons, and support to long file names. These changes made Windows 95 feel like a modern operating system. You didn't need to memorize command line instructions to launch a program. You can just double click an icon. For many users, this is the first time they truly felt in control of their computer. But Windows 95 was more than just a pretty interface. It was a stepping stone to the point where Microsoft truly unified the hardware and the software ecosystem under a single user-friendly platform. Plug and play made installing peripherals easier, 32-bit architecture allowed for more powerful applications, and since it still supported DOS-based programs, users didn't have to abandon the software they already owned. The launch itself was massive. Microsoft ran a $300 million marketing campaign, including TV commercials using Start Me Up by the Rolling Stones, Retail stores held midnight launches. Windows 95 sold more than 7 million copies in the first five weeks, a number that was unheard of for the, for the software market at the time. Just as MS-DOS had brought a level of standardization to the computing world in the early 1980s, Windows 95 brought polish, accessibility, and mass market appeal. It cemented Windows dominance and redefined what people expected from a personal computer. The computer was no longer just for offices and enthusiasts, it was for everyone. Windows 95 also had a chilling effect on a few companies still trying to go their own way. 
Apple, for instance, was still struggling in the mid-90s. Its macOS looked increasingly outdated next to Windows 95. It wasn't until Steve Jobs came back to Apple computers and pioneered the development of Mac OS X until things started to change for Apple. For everyone else, from home users to large companies, Windows 95 wasn't just an upgrade. It was the moment the modern PC experience was born. Today, most people don't even think about MS-DOS. It's not something the average Windows user will ever see or probably ever interact with. And for the younger generations, it might as well be ancient history. But its legacy is still everywhere, embedded in how we interact with technology and how software is developed and how personal computing evolved into what it is today. The entire concept of a PC as we know it, you know, the general purpose machine that runs third party software on commodity hardware, began with MS DOS. And it was the backbone that allowed the IBM PC and its clones to take over the market, creating a kind of informal standard that still persists today. Even though we've moved far beyond DOS technically, the philosophy of compatibility and modularity is still lived on pretty well. You can still see remnants of DOS in Windows. For years, Windows did boot off DOS. Even today, Command Prompt, while no longer serves as true MS-DOS, is a direct descendant. File structures and drive letters with A and B still being reserved for floppy drives and other low-level conventions are still carryovers from those early days. The way we navigate folders, name files, and even install programs can be traced back to those design choices made in the early 1980s. More importantly, MS-DOS and the Windows ecosystem that grew from it helped solidify the idea that software mattered more than hardware. You didn't need to buy a specific machine to run your programs, you just needed a PC that could run DOS and later Windows. That idea drove the mass adoption of computers in homes, schools, and workplaces, and it's still central on how computing works today. We also see the long shadow of Microsoft's dominance in the software world. The idea of building a platform, not just an operating system, became the template for success in the tech industry. Apple eventually adopted the strategy with iOS and the App Store. Google did the same with Android, but it all started with DOS an operating system that can run off anyone's hardware and sold to anyone who wanted it. And then there's Windows itself, still the most used desktop OS in the world, with a lineage that can be traced back directly to MS-DOS. Even in an age of smartphones, tablets, and cloud services, Windows PCs are still central to business, education, and personal computing. Microsoft has layered modern technologies on top of the DOS foundation they helped build and the influence is unmistakable. In short, MS-DOS isn't just a piece of computing history, it's the foundation on which the modern PC was built. It brought consistency to chaos, opened the door for third-party development, and created a software ecosystem that fundamentally changed how we interact with machines. Whether you're using a high-end gaming rig, budget laptop, or even a cloud-based Windows VM, you're still feeling the ripple effects of a command-line OS written more than 40 years ago. It's a reminder that in technology, even the simplest ideas, like a standard operating system, can change the world forever. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. If you haven't yet or are new to the channel, make sure to like and subscribe because it helps the channel out a ton. Um, i like to thank you guys for the, um, by the time this is out, probably 750 subscribers, but I'm thanking you guys in advance, so hopefully that does happen so I don't look like a complete fool. Um, that's about it for today's video. I'll see you guys next week. Wait! We have one more announcement, memberships, channel memberships. I made a separate video for this. Um, uh, join if you would like to, it's $3.99 a month. You get to see these videos early, you get to see all this other stuff early, you get priority reply, pretty much the basic membership stuff, one tier, $3.99 a month. Um, and one more thing, uh, thank you for watching again. Appreciate it, have a nice day.